These days, we design pretty much everything in computers. For example, we design car bodies, computer circuits, and wind turbines with computer modeling. The computer simulations work by solving for equations that calculate things like heat flux, mechanical stress in response to strain, electrical flow in a circuit, or fluid mechanics over a car body. However, all of these devices are made of materials like metal alloys, semiconductors, ceramics, or polymers. For example, let's take a lithium-ion battery. A battery is made up of many different parts like the cathode, the anode, and the electrolyte. Each of these components is made up of several materials, and these materials actually determine the properties of the overall device. For example, if you were to zoom in on the cathode, there are many different chemical formulations that you could put inside your battery, like lithium manganese oxide, lithium cobalt oxide, lithium iron phosphate, or various other combinations. The choice of chemistry that you put for the cathode inside your battery determines its final properties, and you'll have to get trade-offs between things like the capacity and the weight capability and the safety of your battery, depending on the chemistry that you choose. So that's why we might want to design new materials that have improved properties inside of a computer and then put them inside of our device. But that's where things get a little bit tricky. And that's because to model the materials themselves, we need to model what's happening to the atoms in the material and the electrons within the material interacting at blood scales a million times smaller than a millimeter. These entities don't follow normal physical laws, they follow the laws of quantum mechanics. To solve for their behavior, you need to use what's called the Schrodinger equation, and it turns out that this is a particularly difficult equation to solve and therefore simulate. The Schrodinger equation is used largely to describe the electron behavior within a material. The electron behavior is really the key because that determines properties like bonding, interaction with electromagnetic waves like light, transfer of heat, magnetism, and pretty much all the things that we care about. The electron behavior is described by a complex quantity called the wave function. To solve for the electronic wave function, you would need to solve for all the pairwise interactions between each electron in your material through the very complicated Schrodinger equation. And when the system has more than a handful of electrons, like every real material, this simply can't be done. There are too many interactions and the wave function is too complex. In fact, if you were to look at the wave function of just one water molecule, it would be a 30-dimensional function. If you had a thousand water molecules, which is really not a lot of water molecules, that would already be a 30,000 dimensional function that you're trying to solve for. So that's why designing materials themselves in a computer is very, very hard. But that's where density functional theory, or DFT, comes into play. Density functional theory states that all the ground state properties of a system or a material can be described as a functional of the charge density. So more about the ground state part later, but a functional is just something that takes in a function, like the charge density function, and returns a number. So crucially, what density functional theory tells us is that we can switch the theory from the high dimensional wave functions of the Schrodinger equation to one that depends on the charge density, which is only a function of three dimensions, no matter how many electrons you have. So to summarize, DFT can in theory tell you all the ground state properties of your material without having to directly solve the pesky Schrodinger equation. So how do you solve the DFT equations? Well, you need to know the correct density functional, and you also need to know the correct charge density or how the electrons are distributed in space in your material. So let's start with the density functional. There's bad news and there's good news. The bad news is that, to this day, no one knows the exact form of this mystery functional that is central to density functional theory. That is exactly how the charge density relates to various materials properties. Portions of the functional are known exactly, such as the kinetic energy and the Hartree or Coulombic energy, but other portions, like how to describe the quantum exchange interaction uh, and the electron correlation effects, are not known exactly. The good news, though, is that in the meantime, we found some very simple ideas for these unknown parts of the functional that can yield good results for many materials. For example, one can solve for the exchange and correlation energies of a uniform gas of electrons, and then if you have a more complex charge density, 
you can use something called the local density approximation or LDA, which looks at the charge density at every location in space for your material and just pretends that you have a uniform gas in that region and just adds everything up. There's also slightly more complicated forms like the GGA, which also looks at the derivative or rate of change of your charge density at every point. And then there are even more complicated exchange correlation functionals than those that have been devised. Uh, but the main thing is that despite their simplicity, these approximations to the exchange correlation functional can give pretty good results. So now we have the density functional in density functional theory. Regarding the charge density, what the hohenberg cohen theorems of DFT tell us is that the correct charge density is the one that minimizes the energy of the system according to the density functional. But how do we get this charge density, meaning the one that best distributes the electrons in your material, such that if you plug this charge density function into the density functional, it would give you the lowest energy answer? So that's where another key element of DFT called the cohen sham equations come into play. Now actually we glossed over one thing when we were talking about the density functionals, which is the fact that we actually went back to using wave functions when expressing these density functionals. But this time the situation is different because with the cohen sham equations, this is not the same wave function that we had before, but rather we have what are called single particle wave functions in which each electron gets its own individual wave function instead of being tangled up with all the other electrons. So now the dimensions of your overall wave function don't explode like before, and neither do the number of electron-electron interactions. Instead, the electrons interact with each other through a collective mean field that's based on the single particle wave functions, and that gets refined as we go through the process. So even though all this appears to be a simplification with single particle wave functions instead of interacting wave functions, the Cohen-Sham equations are set up to give you the correct charge density, and one that minimizes the energy of the density functional. Okay, so let's summarize. We want to design a material, an arrangement of atoms in space, and solve for the behavior of the electrons within the material, which are tiny point-like particles whizzing around at impossible speeds at extremely small end scales and having very complex interactions with one another through the Schrodinger equation. We managed to accomplish this with density functional theory by replacing the wave function representation of the electrons to a simple charge density representation. From this charge density, and also from the non-interacting wave functions from the Cohen-Sham equations, we can calculate lots of materials properties. Things like bonding and elastic properties of the material, uh, response to mechanical stress and external fields, uh, thermal excitations, and much more. In fact, there are now databases of materials properties, including the materials project, which I'm a part of, that are essentially libraries of calculated materials properties from density functional theory. So is everything solved now? Can we simply arrange whatever atoms we want in a computer, design a material inside that computer, figure out the charge density using density functional theory, and find out everything that we would want to know about that material? Well, no, there are lots of caveats to be aware of. First of all, DFT is not just one method, and there's no such thing as simply a result from DFT. There are lots of parameters that need to be carefully chosen. Uh, in particular, these parameters fall into two broad classes. There's the ones that control the physics of the simulation, and then there's the ones that control the numerical accuracy of the simulation. Now, in terms of the physics, there are many parameters, but the main one is the functional. So remember the LDA and GGA functionals we discussed earlier? They control what kinds of electronic phenomena can be accurately modeled. So as one example, standard LDA and GGA don't take into account van der Waals forces, which are based on correlations between electron densities. So there are many, many other functionals to choose from, depending on what exactly you're modeling and how much computer time you have available to solve these increasingly complicated functional forms. The other type of parameter is related to the numerical accuracy, and this is the number of reliable decimal points in your solution. And you can usually get more numerical accuracy at the expense of computer time. So we won't go into these parameters, but examples include your basis set and some numerical grids and meshes. So here you want to be careful enough to have enough precision in your calculation to give you reliable results, but not so much that you're just wasting computer time. The next important caveat to know about is that although DFT is much more computationally achievable than solving the Schrodinger equation, which is basically impossible, uh, it is still really difficult to model systems with more than a few thousand atoms in it.
Now, note that if you're doing a solid material, these, these atoms can actually repeat indefinitely in a pattern by applying what's called periodic boundary conditions. So you can get like a tiling pattern of these thousand atoms repeating again and again, and technically get infinite atoms. But these atoms need to be strictly repeating and that really limits what kinds of materials you can model. So what do these limitations in the number of atoms mean for practical materials design? Well, first of all, there are many materials that, like polymers, that might require more than a thousand atoms to be able to represent those materials. And for those materials, we need to do approximations of the material structure instead of the exact material structure. Another thing that happens is that there are some materials phenomena, like how cracks propagate inside a metal alloy, that really depend on what's happening at length scales of tens of thousands, millions, or even many millions of atoms. So we just can't model that kind of behavior like crack propagation with standard DFT techniques. Typically what's done if you want to model materials at higher length scales, also for longer time scales, is to actually get rid of the idea of modeling the electron-electron interactions using DFT, and instead model the atoms interacting through some kind of a simpler force field. So then you keep the atoms, that was called an atomistic theory, but then you remove the electrons, so you no longer have an electronic uh, structure theory. So you, you still have atom interactions, but now they don't have really accurate electron interactions anymore. Um, and then as you get to even higher length scales, you might even use modeling techniques that get rid of atoms, and instead group a bunch of atoms with the same type of behavior together as a particular phase, and then do what's called phase field modeling. And then as you get even to higher length scales, like a car body, you might just treat materials as a continuum uh, body instead of an actual uh, set of atoms or phases. Now, another limitation, apart from the number of atoms, is that not every property of a material can be calculated with DFT, even if you can represent that material with a small number of atoms. So we talked about how DFT is a ground state theory. So what it really means is that it refers to electrons and their settled positions in the atoms. When the electrons are excited into higher energy states due to interactions with light or thermal excitations, DFT technically no longer applies. Uh, there are extensions like time-dependent density functional theory or other theories like GW and beta cell Peter that can be used, uh, but this requires, again, going beyond standard DFT. Uh, there are also very complex electronic phenomena, such as superconductivity, that are also not modeled very well within density functional theory. And this is related to not knowing the exact exchange correlation functional that we talked about. And then finally, there's the question of how to actually manufacture the materials that you've designed in the computer. For example, if you were to design a car frame shape in a computer, you can probably at least prototype that shape in reality. However, if you've created a precise atomic arrangement in a computer, you might not be able to make that arrangement at all, not even at a small scale. Things are even harder to make if you want to manufacture these precise atomic arrangements at large scales and in large quantities. So it's ongoing work to determine what kinds of materials designs can be synthesized and scaled up in practice. Okay, so hopefully now you know a little bit more about density functional theory. If you'd like to know even more, I can suggest three resources. If you'd like to know more about the application side, I would suggest a review article I wrote with some colleagues for Nature Reviews Materials called Computational Predictions of Energy Materials Using Density Functional Theory. This article covers the way in which DFT has been used to design new materials like batteries, thermoelectrics, and more. If you're looking for another video that just goes into a little bit more depth about both the theory as well as the practice of density functional theory, while still staying accessible, I recommend a lecture by Astrid Marthensen, which I'll link to. And then finally, if you want a longer resource on the subject that covers it all and again remains accessible, I suggest the book by Jan Steckel and David Scholl called Density Functional Theory, A Practical Introduction. This is the book that I recommend to all my new PhD students. So I've left links for all three resources in the description of the video. Happy exploring.